So without further ado, we're going to, we're hitting on 12 o'clock. It's the beginning of our first panel and Stephanie is going to take over from here. And I'll, we'll see you all later. Right. So technically good afternoon, everyone. And um, so we're gonna start with this uh, first panel of the conference. Uh, and uh, this first panel will be on the theme of local inclusion versus national exclusion. And to discuss this, we are welcoming researchers who are affiliated with the Refugee in Towns project to talk about their ongoing work in, both in the US, in Mexico, in Serbia, and in Mozambique. And so in this panel, we will discuss different situations in various locations that each illustrates different ways refugee migrants are being perceived, supported, promoted, or not by themselves, by the local host population, notably in cities and towns, by the host government, or by official institutions of the place of origin of the migrant group. So uh, this will undoubtedly lead to a great discussion on the different initiatives for integration that have been implemented in these various places. So uh, for that, I'll be facilitating the conversation and I invite you members of the audience to type your question in the chat box that I will then convey to the panelists. Or if you will, uh, you can signal in the chat that you would like to ask the question yourself and I will invite you to convey it uh, to the panelists. So um, to start, uh, we're gonna have, uh, as you know, there were some uh, videos that were recorded and posted on the Refugees in Towns website prior to the conference to give you a broader idea of each um, team's work. And for now, I will invite uh, one by one the uh, five different team uh, that uh, will participate this morning to very briefly present uh, themselves and their work and the main points uh, of their research and findings. So we're going to start with Fernanda Escobar from Brandeis University and uh, Beatriz Almeida de Sten, who is the Consul General of Ecuador in Massachusetts and whom we are very fortunate to have with us today. And uh, they will present us the, uh, how facilitated, how the integration of Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian uh, migrants is facilitated in Massachusetts. So uh, I invite Fernanda and uh, Consul Almeida de Sten to please introduce yourself and briefly present your research and main findings. Fernanda? Stephanie, it looks like they had some connection issues, so they might join us later. Maybe we can just move forward to the other team for now. Okay, so is uh, May Zayek here? I am. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> May is based in uh, University in Texas, and uh, she's going to present her work with the Syrian refugee integration in the American South. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well during these in interesting times. Um, I'm really, uh, thank you so much um, for Refugees in Towns Project uh, for hosting this and for having me. Um, so I did, uh, so my name is May Mazayik. Um, I'm originally from Aleppo, Syria, and I've been in the United States since 2000, so I've been here a long time. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and so um, I did my research uh, for the Refugees in Towns Project uh, in the city of Austin, Texas, and Texas is in the southernmost part of the United States, well, southernmost part that's bordering uh, Mexico, <laughs> so we border Mexico. Um, and uh, Austin's one of those interesting cities because it's a, quite a liberal city in a very red state. Um, so in the spring of 2017, um, I did three months uh, worth of research um, on refugee resettlement, specifically Syrian refugees um, in Austin. And uh, I basically just went over there and did everything from translation to research purposes, but also like helping them with the resettlement process. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I worked with a um, I worked with a uh, group called uh, SARA, Syrian American Refugee Aid. And so these were local. This was a local group uh, NGO that was created specifically just to help the Syrian refugees who are resettling in Austin since 2015. Um, there were a lot of issues in terms of resettlement. Uh, we know in the spring of 2017 is right after President Trump was elected. 
Um, and the Trump administration at that time just uh, froze all of Syrian refugee resettlements in the US. Um, also just the rhetoric in terms of the politics and policies were affecting the refugees um, themselves and they were very worried about that. Um, and so uh, the situation was quite hard, especially for the, uh, also just to give you a background, at that time, Texas, Governor Greg Abbott pulled out of the federal uh, refugee resettlement program, which means that the state still gets funding. It's just that the funding has, there's trouble of where we distribute that funding. Um, RST is a resettlement services uh, in Austin that was getting some of that funding, but not enough. And so, so refugees were having a lot of, the Syrian refugees were having a lot of issues in resettlement where a family of eight was um, getting uh, housed in a two bedroom apartment, a lot of miscommunication, um, also not realizing that one of the biggest things is that they were putting a lot of Iraqi um, uh, Shia, uh, Shia Muslims with Sunni Syrian Muslims, uh, something that I think a lot of people don't understand unless you're from within those cultures, um, cause a lot of problems as well. Uh, so personally, um, what I noticed though with the, the case of Austin, while nationally, the rhetoric was like no refugees we don't want them here the cool the great thing about austin was that the uh the local the locals from whether it's churches to um you know mosques anybody were so, were so ready to help the refugees the syrian refugees um there was even a comment that some were saying we don't want what happened to the iraqi refugees to happen to the syrian refugees um because that community struggled a lot uh, after the Iraqi war. And so with, with the Syrian refugees, um, I think what really helped is having uh, people from the culture also assist. So there was definitely extra assistance uh, from there. Um, but working with them, you know, I noticed a lot of times too, their well being was just very, very, uh, very negative just because they were uncertain. But these resettlement so, so, so services that were basically local NGOs really were the key to helping them um, in terms of social, financial, um, health, every type of everything you can think of. Um, because resettlement is hard for others to understand, but um, the cultural and the English language were one of the biggest indicators, they said, if that they would feel like American citizens or that they're American now. A lot of them have now, when I talk to some of them now, they, um, they're financially independent. They do not rely on anybody. They're, you know, they're starting to go to schools. Um, they are working and learning English. And some of them have green cards. And so now they don't even consider themselves to be refugees. That's a cultural thing we have. So whenever I talk to them in that, in that context, they're like, we're American just like you. And so it's very interesting to see the, different, the, the few years difference but especially when you get that local support, um, cultural support, really having to get people like me who have that background as a Syrian to be able to go and be a cultural translator. Um, so see, these are some of the findings that we had, uh, that I had uh, while I was in um, Austin. Let me know too if you have some questions. I'm the first one, so I'm like, <laughs> what else you would like to... Uh... <laughs> No, thank you. This is uh, this is very interesting case of like positive integration, and as you said, it is particularly interesting to see that thanks to local support, refugees do not nowadays consider themselves as refugee, but uh, they just consider that they are moved to a different location where they are independent, when they have work, where they can communicate, and where they are uh, fully integrated with local population, which is a mm -hmm. very positive outcome, and. Yeah. Um, so we're probably going to uh, go back to you uh, later on uh, with further questions. And uh, so for uh, today, uh, we're going to continue and hear about uh, Fernanda, um, who is going to talk about the integration of Ecuadorian people in Massachusetts. So it's another case of integration in the US. And that is uh, interesting because it shows some similarities and some uh, perspective with the case you just uh, presented. So Thank you. <laughs> so, please, Fernanda, I let uh, the word to you. Unmute. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Uh, good afternoon with everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation first to this panel. Uh, my name is Fernanda Escobar. I am a PhD student at Brandeis University. My focus is on immigration. Um, my presentation was with the Consul of Ecuador in Boston, uh, Beatriz Almeida de Stein. Um, she sadly cannot be here. She is uh, in a meeting right now with the embassy and is still going, so she apologized for that. But I am going to talk a little bit about what we share in that presentation and how we, what is the role of the country of origin governments in supporting integration abroad. Um, the Ecuador's consulate is located in the United States in Massachusetts, where it serves the Ecuadorian population who lives in this state. Um, our presentation, we started by sharing some data on Ecuadorians in the US and in Massachusetts. Um, the consul then share about uh, what is the work of the consulate of Ecuador in Boston and how it's supporting integration of the community. Uh, the consulate's work is to issue documentation under national in the, to the national living abroad and help them out with the problems when arise. Uh, but the consulate of Ecuador here in Boston wants to go beyond that, trying to understand the primary needs of Ecuadorians when they arrive in a new country. The consulate thinks that integration is essential, uh, thus the consulate organized informa informational meetings where lawyers and representatives of immigrant organizations uh, share with the Ecuadorian community information about changes in immigration policies, their rights and duties in this country, and other information that Ecuadorians might find that is um, helpful for them. Uh, Ecuador's consulate work closely with immigrant organizations and other consulates to provide this space for the Ecuadorians here in the U.S. Um, then uh, we were talking about how the consulate used research and data to create programs to benefit the Ecuadorian community here and to inform the Ecuadorian government and policymakers in Ecuador to analyze and develop new policies or programs that benefit Ecuadorians here in the U.S. and their families back home. Um, finally, the consul was sharing how the uh, Ecuador's consulate here in Boston has adapted its service to the COVID-19 situation, including new regulations for those who visit the consular office and adapting the office infrastructure to make it safer for those who come to get their documentations. So yeah, that is a summary of what our, our presentation was and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you so much, Fernanda. And so I find that, uh, so of course, we put the presentation in a specific order to highlight uh, interesting point where here we have a, a case where the Ecuadorian government is helping Ecuadorian population as they resettled in Massachusetts in the US. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, echoes to uh, the case that was presented by May, where we see that uh, the local government through refugee services, he's the one helping uh, refugee to integrate Great. So we're going to continue with uh, different uh, cases and we're going to move on to uh, the one with, uh, so the two next cases also echo to each other with uh, the way the perspectives that they bring into the role of the local population into integrating or not and uh, enabling a migrant to integrate or not in the host in the host cities and we're going to start with uh, the case of uh, Serbia and notably Belgrade with Teodora Yani uh, Jovanovic and Marina Lazitic so I'll let one of you well you can introduce both of you and uh, and to explain uh, the main uh, issues and findings that you have uh, seen while you were working for your report for refugees in towns and since then. Uh, sure, thank you so much, Stephanie. I guess I'll start off and then I'll hand it off uh, over to Teodora. Um, so, like I said earlier, I'm Marina Lazitic. I'm also a PhD student at Fletcher um, and I run an initiative for forced, on forced displacement at Boston University. So my research is really focused or from a master's too, and right now I'm looking at the Balkans because the um, situation there is kind of interesting because Serbia in particular, the country that we looked at uh, in our report, uh, is a transition country. So uh, the refugees used the route through the Balkans to get to Europe and most of them did not have intention to stay in Belgrade. So Theodora and I really looked at sort of dynamics in the city and we did our research in 2018. 
Um, so things have changed quite a bit since then. So I'll talk just a little bit about what we found there when I was there um, with Teodora. Now Teodora is in Belgrade, so she'll introduce herself and chat um, and tell you a little bit more about what's going on right now in the city. Um, but the main finding that we had at that time was really that the refugees who were there were not interested in staying. They really wanted to continue their journey towards Europe. But because the Balkan route was officially closed, um, according to the agreement, the you know, influx of people have stopped and they, they had less opportunities to cross the borders into Serbia, but there were daily arrivals still. And at the time when we were doing our research, there were about 7,000 people in a country overall, and about two to 3,000 were in the city. And they were staying in these informal settlements. Uh, a lot of them were receiving help from local organizations and humanitarian organizations and just the community themselves. And everyone was really willing um, to help out. However, that changed with time. Uh, the local settlement was, or, or the informal settlement was knocked down and everyone was forced to um, register and stay in, ref in um, state provided centers. So that kind of disrupted the dynamic and started this wave of uh, kind of hostility towards them because the people were staying in the city a little longer and the local population was starting to feel a little bit more uneasy because the country didn't have any um, integration systems or proper immigration policies. And also because the Europe wouldn't take them, they were kind of stuck in a limbo. So people in the city were helpful, but then at the time, this kind of weird limbo situation made them prone to suspicion towards the migrants. Um, so I'm gonna let Teodora introduce herself and now give us a little bit of an update on what's going on right now, and then we can chat more in the questions section. Thank you, Marina. Um, well, uh, I'm Teodora, I'm a uh, working as a research assistant uh, at the, the Institute of Ethnography of Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts. I'm an anthropologist and ethnologist. And uh, in 2016, I got involved uh, as a volunteer and uh, as an NGO employee uh, uh, in refugee assistance in Belgrade. And it was in this uh, neighborhood where um, we conducted our research back in 2018. I was working and volunteering there uh, as um, like uh, for one and a half year but it was <laughs> it was pretty uh, dynamic and uh, after that um, I uh, enrolled in PhD studies and started to work as a researcher. And um, yes, uh, things have changed because uh, in 2016 we um, had this uh, refugee crisis discourse uh, that shaped pretty much uh, how much how people responded to uh, to refugees. And uh, but uh, after that, when uh, everybody realized that the borders are closed and that these people are basically uh, staying for a while, uh, their uh, attitudes changed and now uh, we have uh, more this um, anti-immigrant discourse in town and uh, people are generally are scared and uh, they uh, speak about thefts, they speak about uh, refugees being violent and stuff, but they don't actually know that refugees are the ones who are actually suffering this border violence uh, on a daily basis. So, yeah, I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding of um, refugees' presence and uh, of their uh, intentions, because uh, a lot of people hear things that they are just like evil and violent and that somehow they want uh, they feel that they are they they want they are threatened and uh, there is no uh, no more this uh, local activist response and uh, people who are helping refugees are no longer doing it and they kind of withdraw and started doing some other things and um, yeah generally uh, I really feel that. Um, people are scared and <laughs> that uh, it, it's it's hard for them 
I don't know, Marina, if you have something. Oh, that's, I think that's, that's great for now. We can then talk a little bit more about what's been going on. I think for us, the biggest finding really is that, um, you know, there's, there's no integration in Serbia and in Belgrade, and there isn't really much difference between the national and local at this point, except that people who are in the city have a little more opportunities in terms of livelihood, uh, livelihoods, and they work often for NGOs. So they found some ways to integrate by themselves. Um, but we're happy to discuss that more a little bit later in the question section. Thanks. Thank you, Marina and Theodora. It is very interesting to see how the shift in situation of the refugee being stuck in Serbia has completely changed the balance, the way people see refugee and the way they act towards refugees. So we're going to come back on that uh, a little later. And uh, I would like to call Victoria Rios Infante and Cordelia Rizzo to present another case of refugee integration at this time in Mexico. And the particularity here is it share a lot of similarities with uh, the case in Serbia in the sense that refugees were transiting through Mexico and got stuck uh, because of border regulation. So uh, please, Victoria and Cordelia, I invite you to uh, introduce yourself and uh, the uh, core of your research. Hi, um, I am Cordelia. Um, we're, both, uh, we're both zooming from different places. So I am in Chicago. I am currently enrolled in a performance studies program and I came to the subject of migration in Monterey because of the group effort to tackle the effects of, well, border security is, uh, is, is a reaction to Mexico's war on drugs and the declaration of the war on drugs started in 2006. So things have shifted and there's like a joint, um, there's been joint efforts within uh, organizations to understand this and of course, my migratory patterns and the presence of refugees and migrants in, in the city has been something that we are we, we have become come to notice more and victoria uh, she is um, she's uh, also a phd student of the so, uh, social sciences at the monterey technical institute and i think she will she can tell you much more about this we conducted our research I'll, before I tell, but we conduct our research also in 2018. So a lot of things have changed and Victoria would speak more, will speak more about this. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here today and share this virtual space. And I'm gonna give you a little context of our case study. And so I'm gonna start now. Uh, for years, non-governmental organizations and international agencies have pointed out that about 500,000 undocumented migrants from Central American countries, mainly Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, cross Mexico's southern border annually. Uh, Mexico's state uh, apparatus operates through a policy of externalization of borders aligned with U.S. interests in migratory issues, which afford expanded liberty to the armed forces in carrying out detentions through physical and also bureaucratic restraints implemented by institutions. An over-deportation policy completes this mechanism and all this violence occurs in a context of generalized human rights violations and criminality in Mexico, but it's also important to highlight that a uh, specific violence uh, posed over a specific group, such as women, children, LGBT community, and this uh, arises specific needs and specific challenges for mobility. So various kinds of forced labor are well-documented uh, threats along the migrant path, uh, for sexual exploitation besets mostly women, children, and transgender population. Uh, multiple aggressors such as individuals, organized crime, and authorities enact this violence. Forced, forced labor and sexual exploitation clearly showcases this complicity uh, of the state and criminal organizations. In this context, Monterrey remains at once a destination and a transit city along an ever-changing route of migration. So human mobility in Monterrey is complex and diverse. Uh, People pass through and extend their transit, look uh, for opportunities, try to go north to the United States and then come back from the United States. All these occurrences pose challenges for basic human rights demands. So Central American uh, migrants at the beginning of their journey tend to specify that their goal is to reach the United States, uh, more specifically cities where they have uh, family members. And Mexico, as a possible endpoint uh, of their journey, emerges when they arrive in the northern Mexico. 
activists differ in an effort to compromise with their original aim, migrants think of making a, a home in spaces close to the northern border of uh, Mexico, such as Monterrey. Our city is situated in the northeast of Mexico and with more than 4 million inhabitants is the third largest city in the country and is recognized as an industrial center. The city has been an historical destination of internal migration for decades and more recently it has become one of the cities in the country that Central Americans choose as a, des as a destination. So, uh, Cordelia and I, as women uh, who grew up in Monterrey, we pursued this report because we were interested in the experiences of female workers, mothers, and their voices, problems, and contributions, uh, contributions to our shared, uh, shared space that is Monterrey. So we follow Mrs. Sanchez, uh, a woman from Honduras, uh, and we follow her narrative in this report as an illustration of the, uh, the issues experienced by many migrants across Monterrey. So uh, I'm going to stop uh, here so Cordelia can uh, share some insights about our fieldwork. What, what we got to experience in fieldwork is one is that it, there's a perverse relationship, uh, there has developed a perverse relationship in Monterrey because though there is a lot of jobs for, for migrants, the jobs are badly paid and the housing is mostly uh, like when, when people decide to stay in Monterey, housing is mostly in the periphery and it has very bad access to services. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Sanchez uh, is a very, which is of course a pseudonym, um, is a very interesting example because she lives in Suazua where there's really very poor services, but her daughter lives in Pesqueria and these are very far from the city center. But Pesqueria uh, is, is a place where there, there's a new uh, automobile plant and there seems to be better uh, services around. Um, but for example, when we went to, to her daughter's house, which is where we, we visited her, um, there was to, for her uh, granddaughter's birthday, um, there was like a, a water leak. And uh, so it is, it is very interesting, like, yes, we want you here, but no, we don't want you to be part of this uh, city. So something in that, in that respect. And we also conducted interviews while performing embroidery, just being very wary of uh, all the trauma, because by the time that they get to Monterey, I know that I, I've heard that it's not the worst space for them, but it is a, they, they have already traversed a very hard path. And it's very important also to think about the hardship that women go through in the migrant path versus the, the, the hardships that men go through. Um, and that's a completely, that, that's the whole uh, other, other thing, but we try to integrate that as, as much as we could in our report. And we learned so much from the experience. So I don't know, Victoria, you have something you wanna add about COVID times or? Uh, well, uh, just to point out, as uh, Teodora mentioned in their video, that uh, this uh, pandemic thing is not stopping the fluxes. Maybe they have a, a, a going low, uh, but uh, there's uh, right now a migrant caravan coming from, the, from Honduras, so uh, this thing uh, won't stop the, the mobility. So it poses a lot of challenges also in this pandemic context. And that's it. Maybe we can share more uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, we're definitely going to uh, come back to you in the discussion for Thank you for this interesting uh, presentation. And so uh, I just want to remind everyone that you can start to send your question in the chat and uh, we're going to start to address them right after uh, the last case uh, that uh, we want to show today. And this is from uh, Natasha Venavos from Rotary International. So Natasha is currently based in Mozambique. And uh, this is an illustration of uh, another situation of refugee integration, which is people who left the country as refugee and who are now returning in their hometown and how the hometown is welcoming them back. So Natasha, I will let you uh, introduce yourself and present this very uh, fascinating situation. Hi, can you hear me all right? We do. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, well, good evening from Zimbabwe. 
sorry about the lighting. <laughs> uh, so I was, uh, did a case study on return migration, uh, and that was spurred on by my own return home uh, as my family was forced to leave Zimbabwe in one of our big wa outward waves of migration. So Zimbabwe experienced two ma mass waves of outward migration um, of, since its independence in 1980. Um, and then in, in 2017, there was a peaceful coup that resulted in a, re a new rhetoric of encouraging people to return home and, and be begin rebuilding together. Um, and so that was sort of when my research began, uh, looking at people who'd returned home to Harare, Zimbabwe in particular, um, and yeah, trying to understand what was what what made them return, and then how they were being received, and what the integration process was like. Um, in that, I also spoke with different institutions, and sort of picked up straight away one of the issues of why in Zimbabwe, particularly, it's leading to more of a circular migration than um, than a integrated, sustainable return. And those institutions really hadn't acknowledged. The, 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 the idea that return was even a thing or a priority, they saw it as more of a trickle. Um, and so there was no, no policies and, and lack of um, foresight or planning for returnees. Um, obviously COVID has changed that a bit because we've had in the last few months over 20,000 returnees come back. And um, yeah, so this really is starting to become a discussion, but it's still low on the agenda of, of issues. So yeah, in my in my research, the return findings, I sort of I found that most people were returning home for a sense of belonging, and to be part of the rebuilding process, spurred by um, their own personal desires, social ties, but also push factors due to hardships abroad um, in the integration. You know, with people saying things like, "Well, why would I suffer abroad?" when um, I can be home where we, we know they'll be suffering too. Um, and yeah, I suppose then my findings looked at how uh, reconciliation and, and reintegration would be key for sustainable return for people to stay, remain at home, yeah. So that's a little bit about my report, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, Thanks. <laughs> so the, the goal of this is was to give you an, an overview of uh, the five uh, case studies that have been uh, put together to discuss uh, the idea of uh, integration versus exclusion at the local and at the national level. And so now we are welcoming all questions uh, in the chat and we're going to start uh, with one question from Graham Rogers from the International Rescue Committee. Graham, if you want to come and ask your questions too, because I know this is a question for everyone. Hi, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, my question was really just uh, to the to the panel in general. Uh, well, first of all, these were really great presentations, and thanks uh, thanks to everybody. Um, but I'm I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about the role of community networks. Uh, in advancing refugee integration. It's been something that I, I hear a lot from, from our clients, and uh, I'm really interested in exploring the potential for these local community networks uh, to, to really advance um, uh, the, or improve the outcomes of integration. So anybody who can really speak to that question, I'd, I'd be interested to uh, hear your views. Thank you. Hey, um, May from Austin. <laughs> uh, hi, Graham. That's a really great question. If you don't mind, I will at least like take on part of this question and say that um, what really worked in terms uh, locally just to extend like the services of integration uh, with the Syrian refugees in Austin, Texas, is we incorporated a lot of their cultural, um, you know, norms into it because a lot of time, I mean, it's an East versus West thing. It's almost co completely opposite. So, you know, at least for me, understanding that in Syria, cooking food is so important it brings people together so we were able to um, partner with churches where they would throw dinners 
um, that the Syrian refugee women, for instance, would make all the food. Um, we would have like the guys do defke, which is a step uh, dance that Arabs do and other cultures do as well. Um, and then have, you know, Americans and others join us. Uh, so we did a lot of those dinners. We made sure to um, always take the, a lot of the women that, you know, were selling, they sew clothes and things like that to sell their um, uh, goods in the festivals that were in Austin. There were so many international festivals and to get them to see people. Um, so a lot of those little projects, but a lot of those projects came from Syrians or Arabs, you know, that's the one thing I will say about this integration uh, process being, you know, it was rough, but I think, you know, in, essentially, essentially it was really important and it was successful um, because I, you know, I could not imagine, I remember myself, you know, migrating to the U.S. in culture shock. And so having to have somebody like me, for instance, you know, or someone who's very familiar with the culture, uh, but also very familiar with the American culture can be like that bridge, uh, I think helped a lot. So we ended up actually getting a lot of students from the University of Texas in Austin who were Arab, you know, to go in those homes to mentor, um, to do ESL for, for, the, for the kids and for their families, just because I felt like that was something that the refugees, when they saw someone like them, they were able to grasp on a lot more. So these are some of the things that at least we did in Austin for um, extended integration me measures. I hope that answered it. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering also if uh, Fernanda, you could address this question, particularly uh, seeing if uh, the Ecuadorian population that is already implanted in Massachusetts is helping and contributing to the integration of new uh, Ecuadorian who arrive in Massachusetts. Sure, the thing that the consulate is doing is to organize also festivals, especially when are the similar holidays that we have in Ecuador. So we try to bring those holidays here so the whole community can share new arrivals and the people that have been living here for years can share their own experience and share their culture but also trying to open to the public. We also have this uh, annual gala so we invite all the people to collaborate with us and to help actually kids in Ecuador. So we are trying to also invite the community around us to be participate of the development of our country as well and understand um, the, the causes or the reasons why people also come here. So it's not just only about thinking uh, why they are coming here, uh, there are more reasons, more than economically. So it's kind of an invitation to get to know what is happening in our country, in our community here. Um, uh, so that is one way we are doing. And also thinking about our other options. Uh, I've been working with uh, students, high school students during this summer. Most of them, they were new immigrants here. And I feel like sometimes we forget how a small cells in the community like schools, churches can also help with this integration of refugees. And I think that is something that we need to address more and try to work together uh, as organizations and but also like uh, the community as a whole. Thank you. Anyone else want to uh, and address this question? Yes, Victoria. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, well, I believe that the local organizations uh, from civil society uh, have an important role in integration because uh, they facilitate access to humanitarian aid, for instance, but then uh, through another uh, basic human rights, such as uh, healthcare, but also to political rights, such as the recognition of the state, for example, for the newborns in Mexico uh, from migrants. Without the, the, the role that some activists uh, play, uh, there is uh, impossible to get uh, access to the institutions that they are not sensi uh, sensible and they do not follow the, the law, <laughs> and basically. So they can guarantee the human rights and the rights of the uh, migrant people and their children born here. That's an, that's an example. Uh, but uh, 
also, well, mainly the, the civil society organizations are driven by a religious spirit and other initiatives uh, also have a uh, use art uh, and sports to uh, go back to basics, uh, basically, right? Because we live in a city uh, with a lot of uh, xenophobia. So I think um, in, the, in that sense, going back to basics and uh, try to find a uh, Paths and bridges where uh, they uh, people from Monterrey and people from migrant can connect. It's a uh, such an easy uh, thing, or maybe can be uh, looked as a basic thing, but it's very important because it creates uh, bonds uh, with people uh, perceived as others, right? Uh, so I think more or less that's my comment. Thank you. Uh I just wanted to add a, a detail because this is something that Victoria helped Mrs. Sanchez very much with, and it was with registering her granddaughter as uh, as a citizen. So that was that is also uh, I don't remember how much if, if that made it to the report or at least it is in the methodological uh, like in in one of the appendixes. But I think that that's worth uh, just mentioning. Um, Thank you. And so uh, I was wondering if uh, Theodora and uh, Marina, you have something to say about this, particularly considering the lack of support and the uh, reticence from the local population towards uh, migrant, if there are some organization uh, about, uh, of migrant uh, among each other, if they like there is some mutual help that is emerging and some networks that are being created among uh, migrant to help each other. Yeah, I, I could speak, I'll just give you a little bit of information on context and then I'll hand it over to Teodora to speak about that specific question about organizing uh, amongst migrants themselves. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, Serbia kind of um, quote unquote promised its citizens that these people are not staying here, right? And then they didn't come up with any policies. There was no interest to actually try to find way to help people integrate in any way or to make their lives easier there. Quite to the contrary, actually, I think. Um, and also, you know, the Balkans didn't see influx of people from outside of the Western Balkans region before. So that is another key element that plays into this dynamic. And I think when the state kind of gave people this impression that, you know, these are just people, migrants in transition, people on the move, you know, there was no, it was kind of easy to help them and play on this humanitarian feeling in people and remind them of their own tragedies from the war in the 90s, how a lot of people who were in Serbia were refugees themselves and all of that. But then as people got stuck in limbo, I think, you know, there's, it was, it was easy to play on local population's fears. And unfortunately, Serbia has quite strong, radical, far right, um, you know, arm of the government, but also of just civil society. There's a lot more far right organizing than there is on the other end of the spectrum. So we're seeing their narratives come out much more um, in, the, in the local population as well. And I think because the migrants are so isolated, there is no language a connection, a lot of the language barrier, there's no connections between the two. Um, and then this gap and the limbo is just being used by far right activists to really kind of mobilize people against presence of migrants because they are the other. Um, and I think that because there's also a mix of different groups of migrants in Serbia right now too, organizing amongst themselves has also been difficult and we've seen some issues uh, in centers too. But I'll let Teodora speak a little bit more too about the humanitarian scene because there has been some activity in Belgrade and she's been part of it since the beginning and has kind of seen the stages of it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure which question I should address first. Um, I mean, the reason why uh, the attitudes are shifting, I'm thinking about this question, but I'm not sure, but it is, it is the demonization of migrants in media. It is the far-right narratives taking over uh, the scene and uh, everyone are uh, into that and they are listening to these stories. And I get uh, all the time, like, um, my friends, they perceive me uh, as somebody who is protecting the migrants and they, they are trying to warn me all the time. They're trying to prove me wrong all the time. They're sending me these alarming stories 
like uh, that something is going on there is a great conspiracy against uh, like serbian people that, are, that they will be replaced by these violent foreigners like this this is the story this is the main narrative and um yes of course uh, the government has uh, the, i mean they didn't come up with any other solutions they didn't uh, try to uh, e explain to anybody that these people are not here to to replace us or to uh, rob us they, they, like they're doing nothing literally they they don't have they're just working on these containment policies uh, like um, Victoria and um, uh, Cordelia said, like th this is the, the, the official policies to keep people in, contained in camps. And um, regarding the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church uh, role, uh, actually there was one um, NGO, which is actually a humanitarian organization of Serbian Orthodox Church called Philanthropy. And they actually, uh, they play a role in helping refugees. So this organization is actually not against them, but they're helping them. And, uh, uh, but the attitude, uh, like the Serbian Orthodox Church is for now, they're not commenting this issue, but there are like a lot of priests who are um, talking about uh, migrants in a bad way. So I'm not sure but uh, there are uh, organizations that are uh, supported by Serbian Orthodox Church that are helping actually migrants and other uh, religious organizations like uh, Adventist Church is also helping uh, migrants here. They um, uh, fund one uh, center for uh, actually, it is a center for integration of refugees uh, near the camp which is uh, on the outskirts of Belgrade. So uh, yes, uh, religious organizations are uh, interested in this issue. And another thing is that, uh, yes, the most of the people in Serbia are uh, uh, Orthodox, um, Christian Orthodox. And because of this um, conflicts in the past with the Ottoman Empire and stuff, I think that the, there is a big, uh, the big part in this far right narrative is that they are Muslim. The, 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 most of the migrants are Muslims. And uh, Serbians, like, uh, um, they perceive themselves as uh, natural enemies because of our history with the Ottoman Empire and stuff. So I think it is, yes, the religion is one uh, huge aspect of, of this story. Thank you. Thank you, Theodora. That is actually a very interesting point. And uh, I know that Charles has a question that uh, relates to this and uh, to the role of religious institution in the integration of uh, refugees. So I'll let Charles uh, ask his question. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Christian actually raised the question as well. Um, May mentioned the role of churches um, in Austin, which, you know, I, has some advantages and also I'm sure challenges given that there's um, cross-religious mixing. Um, but that's that's a cross-cutting theme I've, I've just heard of with a lot of these cases. So I wonder if May, you wanted to talk about that, Theodora and, and Marina, if you wanted to talk about more about the, the role of priests actually being exclusionary, because I think here in the States, they, it tends to be the opposite um, to generalize. Um, and then others, if you have um, experience working with um, local religious organizations or networks, um, they seem to have a lot of advantages of doing that, but also um, some difficulties. I'd be interested in hearing more. Thanks. Yeah, um, so in the case of, uh, and yeah, it was, to me, it was also very shocking to, to see how much um, these religious organizations were actively, I mean, we even had churches reaching out to us, um, you know, for if we needed volunteers, um, people to drive, you know, the refugees back and forth to different, um, you know, appointments, things like that. 
uh, so that was one thing that I felt like was really strong in the Austin community and um, the mosques and even the, the, the churches have now created like a partnership or at least like they're more familiar with each other. It's kind of interesting that you had to have refugees um, who came who came in and to kind of do that. Right. Um, but it was definitely something that I think was really needed um, because now a lot of the refugees sometimes actually still go to those churches. They still go and bring food and cater uh, cater like different events and things like that. Um, but we definitely made sure that, you know, uh, like I, I was there, like we had kind of like a cultural translator. So we had some people that would go around and kind of make sure that everybody was aware of some of the differences in terms of religion and culture. Like, you know, the Arab women, we did throw them something only for them with other women. That way, you know, if they wanted to take off their hijab, um, just different things that, you know, you wouldn't really think of uh, in terms of how to get them more comfortable. Uh, we felt like the communication with the churches and, and the mosques were, were, were really great. So it's very interesting seeing that dynamic in the United States versus outside, um, especially because the rhetoric in the country, at least at that time, was no more Syrian refugees, you know, and um, just all this negative re rhetoric around them. And so seeing that um, was definitely an interesting aspect of Austin, especially in the South. <laughs> So, good, great question, Charles. Uh, yeah, I can speak uh, just quickly about Serbia too, to add to what Teodora has already shared. Um, and I think that, you know, it's important to mention in Serbian context that Serbia is not in the EU. So the fact that EU shut its borders has also created this negative attitude in Serbia because, and it was easy to kind of quote unquote sell um, the fear to people by saying, you see, they're closing the borders and we will become, as the president has said himself, a parking lot for refugees. Um, so that's, you know, that's just a big problem in terms of how people perceive what's going on. And I think in terms of church organizing, you know, they follow strictly what the government does um, and they kind of collaborate very closely. So I think it wasn't in the interest of Serbian government to be hostile to refugees at any point. Point. Actually, it was easy to win some points in the EU application to the, for membership by being, you know, welcoming and making sure that there are no protests that, you know, that we're actually helping and showing our humanitarian face and whatnot. Um, but then, you know, with time, that has changed. And as Teodora has said, slowly individual people are starting to speak up against um, migrants. And then we have also seen a spike in organizing in terms of like people protesting on the streets. So in early 2020, and even during uh, the pandemic in May, we, we saw people like far right organizing protests in front of migrants camps, for example, or organizing people in Belgrade um, to march. And usually the far right protests in Serbia have a note of religion, uh, religious kind of connotations. They are connected to Kosovo, like Kosovo religion and Russia, like all of that is kind of mixed. So there's always some of that in there, but I don't think at least in our in our research, we didn't really find it that it was like church was really going against migrants by any point. I think it's just like they're going with the current of what their agenda is and they sometimes fall into it, but not necessarily that they're, you know, directed towards them. So uh, in the case of Mexico and particularly Monterrey, migrant shelters led by the Catholic Church and there's also some centers by Christian churches, but they are lesser known. Uh, they're they're very good at helping with the like the immediate the emergency, but uh, and to also um, and um, gradually they become like really big important uh, information centers for migrants as well, routes and connecting, uh, and they had like a they've had a very big role, but it it also now that more of it is known there is a bit of paternalism as well so sometimes that can play against integration. And at times, it is better to sort of branch out from, from that nexus. Um, it's also very interesting to see, I will mention, I'll briefly address the, the gender dynamic because obviously, well, my, my uh, shelters, and, and Victoria could attest more to that, are also very uh, male centers as well. And even, well, even who handles the center, for example, maybe if there's, I know that in Saltillo, like if there's, female leaders, it's very different that there's the, the male priest. So male priests have become very, very important uh, in leading many of these shelters and have sometimes even people that have gained a lot of uh, uh, national notoriety 
they have sometimes spoken against the caravans. So this is what, what has happened recently. And the other thing that I would like to mention regarding the gender uh, uh, imbalance is uh, how the Me Too will also alter the management of these shelters, how Me Too, the wave of, of, uh, of denunciation uh, created by the, by the Me Too also uh, picked up um, abuses in migrant shelters by some very prominent leaders. So this altered a lot of things, but it's also raising awareness of something that has remained very invisible. Um, we also saw that integrate, even integra in integration, the, uh, the female migrant, the mother, the, uh, has a companion with her, uh, that was, which is a child. And also once they're settled, as in the case of Mrs. Sanchez, they sort of become responsible for the whole network. And sometimes they're the ones pushing their kids out to get jobs and, and, and managing uh, the situation. So this is very, very interesting too. Thank you. And uh, I would like also to hear from Tash and I, I know that Karen Jacobson also would like to hear from Tash, both on uh, how, if there are some religious institution or religious centers that, that support uh, returnees are they coming back to Zimbabwe and how, so uh, Karen's question, which is uh, about the community and the government response to returnee uh, in Zimbabwe and particularly in Arare. Uh, thank you. Uh, looking at the religious institutions supporting returnees, they, they, through my research and, and even um, further exploration, there hasn't been anything that particularly looks at returnees uh, specifically, but religious institutions in Zimbabwe are extremely active in supporting all sectors of society like through economic and livelihood um, and they're pretty, very proactive um, in terms of um, human rights and trying to look after the, the people that have been uh, abused or affected by the whole sort of situation in Zimbabwe. Um, but yeah, not nothing in particular to returnees. The be more more like little informal groups like coffee morning groups where um, women would set up for people that had come home to try and create networks and help them to link into the community to get established again. Um, but those tended to be more in like socioeconomic, higher socioeconomic groups. Um, in the more informal um, side, it was more seen as uh, competition um, because of the, the, the lack of the huge unemployment in the country. Um, and I suppose in that, looking at like the community response to transitioning to community response and government response to returnees, um, it's, it was very divided and, and mixed um, with some of the community being extremely positive and, and seeing returnees coming back as, as hope for the future going, things are going to change, we'll bring in these new skill sets and, and rebuild the country together. But then also fear that um, some returnees coming back would come and bring their bitterness back with them. Um, and even some interviews saying we should have an entrance exam for people to come back to make sure that they're coming back with the right attitude. Um, which I thought was quite an interesting idea. Um, and then from the government level to the community level, um, I really feel that um, the people that had left were deserters and therefore, um, because they hadn't been through the tough times with everyone else, they, um, they were returning um, and now milking the benefits of like an improved economy, even though it, it keeps going up and down. Um, and because they hadn't gone through the tough times, it, it did for returnees make it harder to integrate um, because through the crisis, the community had become so much more uh, tight, uh, being coming their own support structures. So, yeah, um, we actually, just before COVID, we had started, we were starting to work on an art project for around integration for um, returnees and in Imbari, uh, which is a big marketplace uh, where a lot of people that come back would go to try and establish livelihoods. Um, so we're hoping it would be a hub where we could work on art, art projects with the community to create and encourage more of that, that integration. Because um, yeah, I suppose there's just such a need for that integration to happen, um, psychosocial healing for the community um, between this home population, returnees, divide and 
and all the other aspects and art and music really cre and, and creating the spaces for that to happen um, is something that we've seen as as a way forward but obviously hadn't made much progress because COVID all the markets were shut thanks actually I, I, I would like to uh... I have another question regarding like the situation of returning because here's a particularity is that these are people who are going back home. So where they have previous networks of family, friends. So what is the impact, importance uh, or support of those uh, previous network in the reintegration of returning mm -hmm. family? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so the networks are, are absolutely vital. Um, but I suppose because there was such a huge movement of, of people um, during that, the last 15, 17 years, a lot of the social ties have been disrupted, um, movement out of the country, uh, sort of over 4 million Zimbabweans had left. Um, and there was sort of also a negative thing of if your family member came back, some people resented them coming back because they now lose the remittances that they were they're getting and the financial support. So a lot of people were encouraging people to stay out, not understanding as family members, how difficult and the hardships and the xenophobic um, experiences of people when they were outside the country. Um, so even there within your own social networks, it was sort of a like, you're crazy. What are you doing coming back? Um, and thinking you should then try and almost like pushing them to go back again. Thank you. That's an interesting, that's a very interesting perspective. And uh, so I, I know that our time is almost, well, it's up, but you know, we still have a little moment. Uh, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Claude Fahim ask a question uh, that is also regarding how uh, people help each other and how the local organization are uh, functioning in Texas. So this is a question uh, mostly for me. And uh, so do you want to ask uh, the question directly to me. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking a lot about the importance of volunteers who share the cultural background um, with the incoming refugees. So I was wondering whether local organizations um, uh, have a deliberate effort to include, so Syrian American communities, for example, um, through outreach or, or other methods, or whether it is really up to these communities to, to reach out to organizations themselves and organize their own volunteer efforts. Hey, Khulud, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, so yeah, in the case of um, Austin, Texas, where we had the Syrian refugees, so the, 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 the city itself, they don't like advertise, you know, who's coming in, you know, for privacy and safety reasons, especially around that time when you have refugees resettling. And so um, really the, the effort that did come from the local grassroots organizations, I think what happened was, I know that I found, I figured out how they, they were able to connect with uh, the Syrian refugees um, bypassing like RST and all the other organizations um, was through, there was a refugee, one of the Syrian refugees was um, in a mosque and he was lost. And he asked somebody like, hey, I don't know what's going on here. Where can I find a grocery store? And he was at the mosque and they were like, um, you know, helping him out. And where are you from? Oh, I'm Syrian. And so the person he was speaking to was also Syrian. He's like, oh, I didn't know we were help having Syrians resettle even in Texas. So, you know, once we, we they made that connection, um, that person went home. And that's actually where the organization be started was from those families who were Syrian um, American that actually had to actively find, look, look for and find um, those communities. And once we did, we were able to help out about 45 families um, in Austin. This was all the families that were resettled there. Um, of course, it was, uh, it was a lot for a small local NGO that, like, like we had, but um, you know, having people like me, for instance, where you understand that transition, even in terms of moving, you understand the cultural background, but I think to add to what you're saying or what you're asking is, also having that um, training of being a social scientist. Um, you know, I went to school for anthropology. I also understand how to work with Muslims. Of, I'm Muslim myself, but I'm not religious, but I also understand, um, you know, I understand how to approach 
uh, Muslims. I understand how to dress, how to uh, different cultural things that we can deal with because not all of the Syrians were from Aleppo, right? We have to also be cognizant that sometimes there are different cultures within the city. Um, the Middle East has so many different ethnic ethnic groups, not just you know Syrians and other countries, but ethnic, eth ethnicities within those. I think the best thing that you know these places can do moving forward is to find people who could be like a bridge, who have that experience of either a refugee or an immigrant, have that background, but also have the the training um, to do to do these things because you do have to balance that with professionalism. It's very it's a very tricky space to be in because personally they they want they want twenty or a hundred of you around, but there's only one, and you have to make sure that you know you're being very um, professional but also personable. You know, so it's a it's kind of that state, but it does come from at least in the case of Austin, it was local all the way. It you know the the state did not have anything to do with their success or integration besides just putting them somewhere? Great question, Khulud. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I have actually one uh, last question that uh, I have been listening to all your uh, examples and thinking also of the case of integration of refugee and migrant who are stuck in France. And uh, I was wondering if you would have something to say about, or if you would know about internal opposition and conflict between uh, people living in city, like uh, individuals or uh, associations who are living in uh, cities and towns, and the government policies that, uh, for example, if you have an association that is trying to help and support refugee, while the government is in opposition to any support provided to refugee communities, and therefore you have some um, internal uh, opposition and disagreement and sometimes violent opposition between the, uh, let's say, police forces and individuals who are helping refugees. anyone had something to say about that <laughs> that makes sense the example <laughs> that i had in mind is uh so i know that recently there were some trials that were being held in france by the government against uh, people in association who were helping refugees by giving them food by giving them shelter for the night by uh helping them uh to uh, remain in uh in city and i have an example in mind of a little village that uh welcomed refugees and provided a space for them to permanently settle, to a home and uh, local jobs within this uh, little village. And they say that it very positively transformed the life of the village. But the government was very furious and started to go against uh, the mayor of the city and against the inhabitant of the city. So uh, I was thinking like, what are the dynamic where the, uh, you have individual in towns and cities who would like to implement ways to integrate and facilitate the integration of refugee, but the national policy go against it and go after them for that. <laughs> Let's see. Is that a situation that any one of you have encountered either in Serbia, in Mexico, in uh, the southern part of the US, or even in Massachusetts? May you wanted to say something? I just wanted to, oh wait, hold on. Okay, so no, sorry, I didn't realize I was still un, uh, unmuted. <laughs> My bad. Um, I don't have much to say about, about that, so because I talk so much. So somebody else, please take that. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm going to mention. I could add. Uh, I, I'm going to mention briefly that there's a line of the government. Uh, for criminalizing the labor of organizations, of civil society organizations and of activists uh, that accompany migrants. Uh, for example, it is very common that uh, activists have uh, are pointed out as uh, smugglers when they are uh, with uh, migrants in their cars. So yes, it, 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 it is a, um, a line from government and I, I believe that also in the border, uh, if the northern border, there are um, strategies, uh, bi binational strategies uh, to pursue also activists uh, from the U.S. that work in, in the border of, in the, in Mexican side. Yeah. 
I could add something from my experience in Australia, if that. Yes, definitely. Please go ahead. If I can. Yeah. Um, in um, we had a when I was working in Australia, it was um, when there was a lot of government resistance because of their of boat arrivals, and and we were, there was a lot of negative publicity from the UN of Australians' treatment of um, asylum seekers and and then refugees further on from that. But um, in that we had this town called Denmark where they publicly became a, a refugee friendly city and they put signs up around the town and they encouraged um, asylum seekers and refugees to come to the town. Uh, partially they got the, the whole town on, on board and they had community meetings around it and um, encouraged people to come um, partly because of economic development, bringing in those skill sets, because uh, it was a, a rural town. And it really put a lot of positive peer pressure on the government because it was showing what this group of committed, compassionate um, citizens were doing in, in Denmark. Um, and I was working for Red Cross at the time and we went and did community conversations there. They invited us a couple of times to try and also uh, support the members of the community that were a bit against um, and weren't fully on board with this idea um, to, to uh, we, we did um, in search of safety presentations to to give context to where these people were coming from and why and and the refugee convention and and people could ask in a safe place questions around it all but yeah our um, experience from that was that it really put positive peer pressure on, the, on our government that was putting more and more harsh policies towards um, refugees and asylum seekers thanks Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you all of you for uh, those very interesting presentation and uh, this perspective that you brought to the question of uh, in a refugee integration. So our time is beyond up and uh, I would like yet yeah, to invite everybody to stay and to have uh, what we called a coffee break, but like a virtual coffee break. So we're going to have this, uh, everyone is invited to chat with each other and you can ask, anyone can ask a uh, more informal or more personal question to uh, the speakers. And I would like to remind you that at 1.30, we're going to start our second panel, which is on refugee helping themselves and being helped by host and uh, about integration as a two-way process, which is exactly in the continuation of the end of this conversation. So uh, this panel will start in 20 minutes. Stay with us. And right now, we can have more informal conversation. And if anyone does need to log off before the next panel, you can just click on the same link to get, to get in at 1.30. Thank you.